Hello, everybody. Welcome to 321 New Kitten. This is Bobby the Awesome. And today I am joined with someone who is going to give me not only professional wisdom, but I think a little personal wisdom too. Welcome to the show, David Sarazzi. Did I do it right? You did it right. I'm well, always I'm intimidated. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited about being here. Well, uh, as I said, before we get on the air, we have a little similarities. But before we get into that, um, why don't you tell my audience a little about yourself? Like maybe where you're from? What do you do? Why Why did you want to be on the show? Well, I, I come from a little town of Eagle Rock, a little community in northeast Los Angeles, born and raised with a father that was a TV star from the age of one years old for about five, six years. And, and then I ended up going to college, you know, when I turned 18 and then finished, got my degree at UC Irvine. And then I ended up working on my master's, but it took me 10 years to figure out what I really wanted to do. And I got into sales, which I, you know, found myself at 30 years old, like a lot of kids do. And a lot of people do. Everybody thinks they go to college for four years and they're going to get that fantastic job and life is going to be beautiful. You're going to get married and happy forever and have all these kids. Well, anyway, I covered most of that. You know, I got through one marriage and I'm on a, a second one. And, uh, but basically, I mean, that's where I started my life. And uh, it was a very interesting life because my father, uh, you know, and s- sister both struggled had mental illness struggles. And I lived through it, learned a lot. I've uh, been in sales for two major corporations, Fortune 500 companies, been a top salesman for them for many, over 35 years. And uh, it's I learned a lot and I kind of rechanneled everything I learned, the negative and positive of everything that went down and People love me, and I, I got a sense of humor that my sister and dad had, and it's all worked out. I'm making very good living, actually, at the stage of my life in the seventies right now, I basically is making more money than I've ever made in my life as an independent consultant, using all my knowledge base. So, years ago, when I was with a company, a guy told me he says one of the directors had guy he says, "Dorazzi, how do you do it?" And he says, "I'm just." I'm just myself, man. I love life. I just love what I do and happy I'm here. What just showed up for me as you were speaking was, isn't it incredible that we can come from families that have the mental illness yet somehow end up successful? It really is because as I look back, I mean, it's it's interesting you asked me that because when I was in high school, my dad was going through his bipolar manic depressive stage. And, you know, as on the football team, most inspirational player, people had no idea what went on at home, you know, and people have no idea, you know, even when you're in the sales world and you're working with somebody, they just love being somewhere else. They can avoid dealing with all whatever's going on in the rest of their life. So I picked up on that and it's been a great ride, you know, I, now it's time. That's why I started writing books. And, you know, I wanted to share what I learned. And then, uh, you know, my next book, because forced by my kids, I got four sons like, through all this and they're all doing great. And they told me, Dad, you should be the next book. And I go, yeah, OK, let's go. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't I think my working theory is that I didn't want to end up like everybody else. So I channeled my energy into work. Do do you have any theories about how you like were able to progress and to survive and thrive? Like you're thriving. Yeah. I think, I think you gotta, you gotta set yourself apart. What's interesting. You're right. I think what I really believe is, you know, you don't look, you know, it's kind of like sports. You don't look at your competition. If you're really good at what you're doing, you don't get hung up on all these little side things and you just focus. In other words, I'll be honest with you. When I, it's going to be in my book. I never admitted it, but you know, you, I, I've had sales quotas for years. I've had all that stuff. And I think I don't even look at my numbers and I end up number one. 
you know, because I got my system down and it's like, I mean, I'm I'm not no exaggeration. Over 35 years, I've been at, in the top two percent of up to 500 salespeople in the entire country. Wow! Congratulations. You Thank must you. be you must be passionate about the product too. Like I believe you have to believe in what you're selling to sell it, right? And it sounds like oh, you're you do. I, tell you a funny story when I first started. You know, when I was like 30. 30 years old, I get in the car with the manager and he says, Hey, he says, you got to, I got to take off. He was with me maybe a half hour. I didn't know what anything driving downtown LA. He said, here's a book, learn it all. You know, and I go, Whoa. And that was selling hand soap at that time. And then I got into water treatment, which is I do today. I'd, I've been treating water for over 30 years and as a consultant, but, and I didn't know anything. So I learned a product every day. First thing I learned was hand soap. You know, I made my first big sale selling hand soap. I didn't know that anything about hand soap, but you're a hundred percent right. You got to know your product. If you don't, and you're not sold on it, you know, you're not going to sell it. You got to believe in yourself, believe in the product. Yeah. And that's, that's what I live by. And it's, you know, the follow up sometimes is fun. Sometimes it's not, but it all comes together at the end when you get your paycheck. <laughs> yeah. Follow up is so crucial. I, I, <laughs> watch way too much Grant Cardone stuff probably um, yeah. and, no, and sales not. has taken on a whole new personality since since watching him and learning from him oh yeah and let's face it sales it's interesting is what did people do during this crisis we had for two or three years I mean I can imagine a young kid out of school just starting to sell again saying oh my gosh you know because you don't get the emotional interaction and that's what you got to have and so what did I do when all this happened? Okay, I picked up at, at this stage of the game. I never throw away a business card. Everybody used to laugh. But my cards are all over. They are, They said wherever they went, my cards were there. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I went and I connected with the people that may be successful before. And, you know, hey, are you still doing it? I said, well, I can be. So, so I ended up doing it again in the last eight, 10 years. I've been independent. So. That's, That's how it all began. Yeah. I know I went down the, the work rabbit hole, but it's one of the things that gets me excited. So, so you've, uh, you've alluded to a book a couple times. Um, so you want to talk about that? Like what's your, what's your mission with the book? What's it going to be about? When can people expect it? I just totally asked you so many questions in one sentence. <laughs> That's okay. No problem. Yeah. Are you talking about the two books that I've written? Well, are you talking like about writing- the book that I'm, yeah, I've written three. Two. Okay, yeah, the first book is a book. Uh, it's not too clear there. Okay, there you go. Is it clear? Not uh, really. Okay, anyway, the first book is my dad's story. The reason I wrote that is because he saved his journals, and I found him about 15 years ago. Um, died, and I took all his journals. He wanted to write a book. He was the oldest of 11 children, and he wanted to write a book about his family. And so I took all that with my memories and all my experiences, and that's in my first book, The In-Between Artist. Now, it's called The In-Between Artist because my dad was the first in-between artist for Walt Disney, for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and created Dopey. And But then from there, he went to radio, he went to TV, but he had five uh, nervous breakdowns and 37 shock treatments along the way. And I was there during that time, and... He had really a colorful life. And I think there's a lot of genius behind the people that have, that struggle with mental illness. And so I finished that book and then I thought, well, and then all of a sudden my sister passed in 2010. She died at 52. She was a co-star on Happy Days with Ronnie Howard in 1974. And, but, and she was in movies and everything else, but then she had a nervous breakdown at 18 and she struggled between 20 and 39, just on meds now and then. And 39, between the ages of 40, she had a child. She said she was going to have a child. And then from there, uh, she did have a child. Nobody thought she never really got married. And she had a child. And uh, she went in and out of uh, halfway houses uh, between the ages of 42 and 52 before she passed away. And so I've kind of, through their life, both of their lives, I became their caretaker. 
And I think, I guess what, what I want to get out of those books is people that have mental illness in their family, that they could be, get involved, listen to them. I know some of them, you know, it's really very uncomfortable sometimes because they're delusional. They do crazy things. I don't even know if you can say crazy anymore, but uh, anyway, she, but you dig in and you help and they trust you, you engage with them. And so both these stories that I wrote there showed that if you engage, just like you do in sales, you can, you can win them over. And I put my dad in the hospital at 14 years old. My mom couldn't deal with it. I sat next to my dad at 14. I said, dad, you got to put your, commit yourself. I said, you're, you know, and he looked at me, David, you want me to? And I said, yeah, because my mom couldn't talk him into it. You know, it's very, that hurt, man. And I saw him carried away when I was seven years old in a straight jacket, went away for six months, the age of reason. I asked my mom, where's dad going? So it's things like that that I think that I experienced. You know, it was like a gift from God when he came back home, but he was depressed. He got all drugged up. But it was like, you know, it, it was cool. And I lived through it all. As far as my new book, uh, my new book will be about, I look back and it's like, I've had a career, amazing career. I've met a lot of interesting people. I've been the top gun and, you know, you've heard the movie Top Gun. I've been the top gun in sales with every Merck when it was the number one Fortune 500 company across the USA. I still have the gold coin they gave us, you know, and I, I took everything I had along the way. It all started when I was a paper boy. At nine years old, you know, I I was making 30 bucks a month because we didn't have anything. My dad lost all his money when he was going through these cycles. My mom didn't work. So, you know, and I learned the value of money and I, you know, I've saved, I've owned real estate. Uh, You know, I, I get at one time I owned 14 pieces of real estate in in Southern California. In California, yeah. Oh, well, then you're a gazillionaire, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm up there, not a gazillionaire, but, uh, you know, as a one-man show, I did it. I didn't really count on anybody else. I didn't know real estate. So one of the things that I did 25 years ago, I got my real estate license to have it. So I've negotiated all my deals and everything. And once in a while, I help family and friends. And so it's like anything to do with sales. I mean... When I was in the grocery business, I, I, there was, like I said, when I graduated from college, I was in the grocery business. All of a sudden, 22. And then, and then I have all of a sudden I get married and, you know, I end up working in the grocery business for some years before I finally woke up and realized that I'm not going to be a grocery checker all my life or a manager. It's like I got some knowledge in there, man. I, I, I could do something and you just feel tied down and. All of a sudden, I had two kids, but that didn't stop me. Everybody says, hey, man, you got kids. Why are you quitting this industry? You're a manager of a grocery store. And I said, yeah, man, it isn't for me. <laughs> in addition to that, though, I went through a, a traumatic thing. I actually was in, I, I was in a holdup where a lady got shot. I went home and I says, I'm not going to do this anymore. So that had a little influence, too. Wow. <laughs> you know I, what I mean? All right. I have a bunch of notes. Um <laughs> I, I love how much we have in common. So grocery store is my roots. Like that was my first God. job and it's, it's been my career most of my life. Um, yeah. And I, I thrive in that environment. I hate going in as a shopper. I like have like, like, especially at holiday time, I'm like, get out of my way. But as an employee, I am like in my groove and um it's funny, you know, grocery could be very lucrative and I don't think people understand that. Um, I, I loved grocery, but I had oh, to was, go through shootings and crazy things. So, yeah, I was, I was assistant manager and they made me a man about the time they were offering me a manager's job. I turned it, but you're right. In the early years, it was, it was great money. It isn't necessarily, you know, it isn't as good as it used to be today, right. but, but back then it was like big bucks. I worked in a grocery store at night. I was a, I was a lifeguard during the day. I mean, I was rolling. You know, when I first started working and I'll never forget the first job I got in a grocery store, I was 16 and yeah, yeah, 16. Cause you start working back then. And I went every couple of days, I went and talked to the manager, true story. And he looked at me as a Italian guy, Bill Patino. And I, and I looked, he looked at me, he says, man, you really want this job. So it's kind of like the follow up idea. I just, 
And I'll never forget that. And then, and then one other one in later life, this guy, he says, uh, you know, he says, I'm working with this company. And he says, the guy never, never shows up. He says, you show up more than he does. And it, I got the <laughs> business. It's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny. Wow. Okay. I'm going to go back. You were talking okay. about, um, you were talking about the first couple books. Um, I want to dive into a couple of the things that you said. One is when I was in rehab. So, so this is six years ago, right? And I go in as not the mindset that I have today. In my head, I thought that everybody could do what you and I are doing, right? Everybody can um, live a normal, I'm using air quotes, life, um, or can get a job or do the things. And in there, I met a lady. Um, so, so I was very like, um, I, I just had like this really not generous love and compassionate mindset when I went in, you know, full disclosure, because I was like, well, if I could get out, why can't other people get out? Like that was my logic. Um, I've learned a lot more, uh, than I knew then. And and I have the podcast to think for that as well. But you mentioned shock treatment and that's what this lady who kind of reframed it for me. She's the first person who had a discussion with me about um, the consequences of it. So she would, she had one career and then she'd have the shock treatment, but then it like erased what she knew. Like, I think she was like an EMT, but then she couldn't be qualified because the shock treatment, um, mess her up or cleaned. I don't know. I don't know what it does. That's why I'm kind of curious about like what your outside lens into shock treatment was. And I don't even know if they use it anymore. I sure hope not. Cause it sounds pretty. I, I tell you what, boy, you asked the right guy. When I, my dad lost his memory for six months. This is a guy that had his own TV show for KTLA, one of the biggest stations in California. I don't know if it's nationwide. And all of a sudden, he he gets in his accident at 47. He he has this nervous breakdown. He doesn't recognize my mom. He lost everything. But and he was compared to Michelangelo. It's in the book when he went to university, you know, uh, American League of Arts in New York. He was the top of his class. I mean, he he won first place in the Chicago World's Fair with his artwork. So he gets out and he just. He just doesn't remember much of anything. And it, it just destroyed. But then, but it got back, you know, he would sleep for 12 hours a day. But my dad was so smart. He'd bring 12 books and he'd read those 12 books on art in two hours. So when he got back, he kind of regained all his knowledge and he started painting again. We had a studio in the back of our house. He had his own studio. We called it Cloud Nine. I got a cabin in the mountains. I call it Cloud Nine. That's where I write. And but he actually came back. He became a great, he ended up going into sales because, you know, he's an entertainer and uh, he did great. My dad was a top gun and I watched him and I kind of hung out with him when he was got a little better when he was selling cars in the fifties, the latter fifties. And he was a top salesman and it set records in sales. And so you know, toward the, and then he, he took up part-time acting again. You know, he got back into TV. It was on Sanford and Son, uh, All in the Family. I mean, my dad was amazing. You know, even though I didn't spend a lot of quality time with him, but and I got to know him so much better when I wrote his book and that he wanted to write someday. And it, it was a trip. It really was. There, there are so many beautiful things about what you just said. Um, one thing is, that just keeps jumping out at me is you're so positive, like so freaking positive. And I say that through the lens of, again, this old version of Bobby that didn't give grace and compassion, right? It, instead, it was resentment and it was anger. And it was uh, at one point hatred. I, I, I don't use that word or feel that feeling anymore, but um, and here you are like 
my biological father was an amazing musician. He could play like the harmonica and the guitar at the same time. He could play the piano, you name it. Um, and instead of embracing music, for example, I shut that off of my life. And I'm just realizing that now. I didn't come from a take the gifts. And it sounds like you really embraced the gifts. Oh, yeah, I really did. And on top of that, my mom, she she was gave me so much positivity. I mean, it's just reinforcement. It's amazing. I mean, through the years, I'd get the biggest account I ever got. And she says, what do you got next? You know, it's like, what's next? And, and it's like, I'm not really, you know, a lot of people are jealous of other people that are successful or, but people that are down and out. I met a guy at the gym just a couple of weeks ago and he's changing jobs at 47. He says, I've been the top guy forever, but I'm nervous. I'm scared. You know, I'm going to take on this new avenue. I said, look, I says, I read a book once, Dennis Waitley made a comment. He says, it was a motivational guy. He says, if you're good at what you're going to do, you're always going to be gonna be good at what you do and what you know best. And I, I I live by that. In other words, and nobody could take that away. It's like, you know, it's like I said, and I, I've learned so much. I mean, years back, they were going to promote me at one of my jobs when I was with Merck and and the, and the bank guy says, Duraz, he says, I don't think it's a good idea if you take that manager job right now, because the more you learn, the more you're going to be valuable to anybody that you're going to be working with. And man, it's paid off tremendously. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Um, the other theme I heard when you were talking about your father, and I love that you got to turn his journals into a book like that is really freaking cool. Um, not only is it impressive that he wrote them. Right. And was dominating right. his life, like through all of these things that you're talking about, like, that's incredible. But what I hear from your story and describing him is he just picks himself up every time. It sounds like he just. Oh, yeah. That's what I, that's what I say in the book. And it's where he took every upset and he came back every time. It's like, and, and you read these stories. I'm just reading right now. I'm reading the, the, there's a sucker born every minute by uh, Barnum, Barnum and Bailey, the guy that did the circus and he got knocked down. He's going bankrupt. And it's like, knock on wood. I've never been bankrupt. I did go through 2008 when all the properties and I had all these loans and it was crazy, but I survived and you just don't look back. And in other words, it's, it's like, if there's a will, there's a way. I mean, and that's the way I look at life. I mean, you know, I, and I thought it was ugly getting a divorce after 19 years and four kids. And, but it's like you, you, I woke up and you just say one day, Hey, life goes on. And if you don't look at life that way and it, it, everything's a risk, but it's like everything's worked out, but it didn't stop me. I kept going and I, I, I I'm pleased. I'm happy. I'm happy where I'm at in life. Your one page of it should say beacon of hope and positivity. That's that's what I'm getting off of you. I'm so bummed I didn't get to meet you when I was in California. Like yeah. I really, really wish I got to like go out and have a coffee date with you because I oh, have to really learn so be much. Great. If you're ever out this way, I'll I'll let give you my number, look me up, and we'll definitely do that. Yeah, sure. like this is just you're yeah. filling my heart up in just such a good way. And I'm thinking about you know, the audience listening, you know, people who are having that rough day or um, that rough time or period in their life. And, and just to listen to you is just so heartwarming, David. So thank, well, thank you. you. Yeah, uh, thank you. You know, the second book that I wrote, I gave it the title because my sister, even doing, she was, you know, she was, she was diagnosed with schizophrenic paranoia. My dad was mad depressive. But she'd always warm a room and she'd walk, is everybody happy? <laughs> so one day I was trying to figure out a title for her book. And that's how I came up with it. Because my voice says, hey, man, yeah, Kathy, oh, you say, is everybody happy? Because there's some inserts in there with what they thought of my sister and their experiences with her. It's kind of cool, too. How come you didn't end up in the entertainment industry? Do you get asked that a lot? Yeah, I do. I really do. And I, you know, it's funny. I, I guess I was the only I had my dad was going through these cycles. My sister, you know, it was, was kind of like the highlight for my mom. It was about nine years difference. And so she took her by the hand because my mom wanted to be a movie star. She was beautiful. There's a picture of her in the book. And basically, uh, I, I don't know. I guess I got caught in the middle. I had a couple of brothers that had some issues. And uh, I was the, my mom used to call me the golden boy, but 
I never did get caught up in the entertainment. I was on the prizes, right? Won the big deal. I was on the dating game. I didn't get picked, but I had a good time. I was on uh, Let's Make a Deal. I went that route when I was working and I got picked for every show and I had a lot of fun. I won the big prize, $10,000 worth of stuff in 1976 uh, on Price is Right with Bob Barker. I got so excited, I stepped on his foot and everybody said, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> when he had a bad foot, he, yellow ribbon day, you know, with Tony Orlando and he said, don't anybody be careful with my foot. And I got so excited and he wasn't too happy, but the show went on. <laughs> uh, yeah, you you have met some pretty cool people. That's awesome. Yeah, I tried out for yeah. Wheel of Fortune three times. And Did you really? Yeah, I made it to the semifinals once. Um, and and actually, it's kind of it's it stifled me because I always thought I didn't get picked because I'm not, I don't look good on camera. Um. And so for all this entrepreneurial stuff and podcasts and and now now we're on YouTube and not just audio, that was like a mental block for me. It was like, well, Wheel of Fortune didn't pick me because my story was interesting and I was a good puzzle solver. So Ah. I just created this whole thing. And I think I tried out for um, the Millionaire Show. Yeah, I've tried out for a few of them. But Wheel of Fortune, like that was my jam. I love that show. (laughs) I bet. Yeah, it's a great show. It's a great show. You got to have it down. You got to know a lot. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I was so mad, though, because in Gamblers Anonymous, because I was in an experiment back then, and they're like, you can't go on Wheel of Fortune if you're a compulsive gambler. And I'm like, why not? I couldn't connect the dots because I'm like, there's no money involved. What's the problem? I'm not paying to go, but I understand their perspective now. I don't know that I agree necessarily, yeah. but I understand. Right. Okay. You, I have two other notes written. Um and and this is an, more of an observation that I'd, I'd love for you to expand on. And you touched on it. It seems that it seems to me, and I, I guess this is just because I just had a conversation with mom too. My favorite band is Blue October. They play the song at the beginning of the podcast. Mm-hmm. And the lead singer has gone through addiction, depression, suicidal ideation. I mean, like all the things And he's very talented, like all this music that he wrote and all this stuff. And he had said the other night at a concert, he was like, well, yeah, I don't remember those 10 years, but it produced all this good stuff. And you kind of said that Um, the mental illnesses weren't obstacles and it helped with all this creativity. Like, that's what I'm hearing. Do you do you feel that? they're related or do you feel like your family was creative and mental illness didn't stifle them? Like, like what are your feelings around that observation? I think, yeah, I really think it does. I think if you're creative, I mean, you're all artsy. I got four sons and one of them's, I mean, they're all creative. It, you know, as far as myself, I took that creation. I always, when I did a talk when I was the number one salesman years ago and, you know, for Merck, I said, it's like painting a picture. It's like you're creating something that that's not there, but in the end, you're, you're happy with it. You're finished. You're finished with that painting. It's exactly what's interesting growing up with my dad. He'd do a painting and I always say, dad, why don't you sign it? So I used to paint with him when I was 14 on through high school out at three o'clock in the morning because he had never sleep. (laughs) It's crazy. But, and, and, and I says, he says, Dave, he says, I don't want to sign it until it's done. And I guess an artist, and I think when you create something, you have an idea. It's, it, and you know, what's weird that I feel that I'm creative too. And I don't know, it's something that's, that maybe it's God given or something is I get hunches and it's like I pursue those hunches and 90% of the time I'm right. It's really, it's interesting in life. And if you really get to the inner mind and let it really go to work and you're zoned in on something and all of a sudden you have a hunch, and, and yeah, why not? You know, it's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, I love that you said that. Um, that's, that's been one of my focuses is trying to work on my intuition and, and hearing and trying to decipher between the hunch and the noise in my head and the thoughts. So um, I haven't heard many men talk about intuition. And I think that's what you just described. So I'm I'm glad that you said that. It's reaffirming for me. Uh-huh. 
Um, well, sometimes, sometimes I'm selling. I, I know what people are going to say. My mom used to tell me that I had, well, our family has this. And I, you know, maybe anyway, it's like, maybe it's from the creativity or something, but I know what they're going to say before they even say it. It's kind of like, whoa, I don't admit it to them, but I take advantage of it. I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So I have a confession to make, and this will be a teachable uh-huh. moment for my audience. Um, so I got so enthralled when you were talking about the first two books. I did not get my head wrapped around. I was not fully present. My brain was going. I was taking notes. So can you explain what the next book about is again so we could dive into that a little more? Okay. The next book will be about how to be in the top 2% of sales in your in your sales world, men or women, no matter who you work for or what you're attempting to sell. I have, you know, ideas that I have and tips that I'm going to put in there and experiences I've had in life, the funny ones, the crazy ones, maybe the not so crazy ones. But (laughs) anyway, it's all part of it. I'm going to give everything I got from the age of 30 years old, you know, I'm near the 70s right now. So, I mean, I'm going to tell them and give them a map. And if they follow it, It'll happen. I know it's a lot different now with social media, but you could take it and it's social media. But in my years of sales, it was primarily with the interface, the interaction. And that's what I'm going to give them. I'm going to give, I know there's been all kinds of motivational sales. I've read it, probably all of them. I mean, 90% of them, but I'm going to give them from my point of view, just the, the little blue collar guy that was born and raised by you know, an artist, a TV guy, kind of in a crazy family. I'm going to show you how I got to where I got, and I want to share that with the world, and hopefully they'll learn from it. And, you know, I've already started it, and uh, give me a couple years, and I'll put it out out there, and hopefully I'll leave my legacy to say, hey, Dave did it his way. You know, I know I'm a big Frank Sinatra. Dave did it his way, you know, and he's going to share it with me. <laughs> well, and <laughs> Not the- my way. The proof is in the pudding and you're very successful and I'm sure people want inside your brain, right? Because you right. have gifts to share on this. So I love that that's the lens you're writing this next book through. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. And like I said, it's, you know, I wanted to get the legacy of my dad and my sister out there. And now I want to share where I'm at, what I've learned, you know, and, yeah, hopefully somebody will get something out of it. And, hey, I, I think they'll enjoy all these books and uh, all the stories. And that's what life is. life is about, a bunch of moments and a lot of stories. And I think I got some good ones. <laughs> it sounds that way. We didn't get really into your sister all that much. Um, so do you want to share like what what that was like? You said listening was one of the key components. Um, yeah, it really was. I mean, you went through what you went through. I used to, those 10 years of her life. I saw her every couple of weeks. I talked to her every week. She was, and then she moved around a lot, but we had always engaged. I'd get her out to, you know, even her delusional state. Like it's interesting. She was really into music too. I mean, her big bands were Journey, uh, Don Henley, uh, uh you know, uh, uh, who's that? David Lee Roth. And, she even had delusion. She was married to him and had their kid. And, I, and I'd be sitting with her just over food and stuff. And I'd say, you know, having a lunch, I'd say, Kathy, that can't be real. Yeah, she says, maybe not. You know, I mean, she broke a few times. She says, you know, maybe not. She says, I never had a wedding or anything with him. So maybe I'm not married. To, you know, it's, but it's like, so what I did is like, and she, we'd always laugh together. I mean, and then, and then one time my son brought his, at this halfway house he was in in Riverside, he brought his band in. We played music and I got all these, they got all these 60 people that were sick, you know, in rehab and, and they start dancing. And I, I guess, you know, she, but I engaged with her. I mean, I was a big part of her life and, you know, I made it tough because my family never understood my relationship with my sister, but it was like, if you're not there for him, nobody else is going to be there for him. You know, I mean, and like you said, you meet interesting people, but, you know, there's some bad people in those places, too. I mean, you know, it's 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 but it, you got to get the best 
out of the good and the bad. You know? How did you keep, I call it our bucket, like how did, uh, keeping my bucket full of positivity, right? So that when the hard times come, I kind of have this, this reserve to help me through the uh-huh. struggle. How did you keep your bucket full in these situations? Like, how did you take care of yourself? How did you find that strength to continue to be a resource or? I I guess because I guess the the family, my mom kept me together and, you know, I, I'd always the sense of humor thing. And even though I burnt candles at both ends, I mean, I managed to get it done and I never complained. I, you know, I keep moving, I keep exercising, I try to eat healthy. And, you know, I, it's, it's like, I, I guess, you know, I meditate some and, you know, just kind of think of what the next move is going to be. And, you know, I just take everything you have at the moment and just try to bunch it together and turn it into, turn it, what, a sour apple into a sweet <laughs> orange or something, man. I don't know. It's, it's just, I just, because I just love being positive. In other words, it's in my blood and I, I got all my kids kind of joke about it sometime because I was a coach literally for 14 years and, you know, we're last place beginning of the season, but I motivated all the kids and all of a sudden we're first place, you know, and because there's nothing like going from the bottom to the top and, you know, it's not all about winning, but it sure feels good, you know, and that's, I guess that's the way I look at it. Uh, you know, and then if you could help people, and I really felt that I could help people. And I was there. To, I realized the point of my life was to help my sister and my dad. But then I like to help other people. And then if you give people what they need, you're going to be successful. It's not necessarily in life. It's what you want. It's what you need. And, you know, I had that love within my family. And I, it, kept, it kept me going. And I, I just heard so much gold in what you said. So I want to recap it. Is that all right? That's fine. Okay. So I heard it starts with having the attitude of staying positive and like keeping your eye on the ball. Cause that's a choice, right? We can have mm-hmm. a negative right. attitude or a positive. Correct. I heard that you take care of yourself with food, rest, exercise, um, mm-hmm. meditation. So all that. Mm-hmm you know, woo woo, I'm going to call it all the things that are now coming to light and really being um, part of the conversation around mental health. And then I also heard, and I love that you reinforced this, and maybe it was intentional, maybe it wasn't, but having purpose and serving, like, that's an amazing way to fill your cup by, and, and let me be clear for the audience. I'm not talking about doing for others like doing what they need to be doing, but inspiring, leading, challenging, listening. Um, I'm not talking about taking on their shit because that's not what serving others is about. Um, So you said all that in like a minute. (laughs) So true. I mean, I try to stay away from negativity as much as I can. I mean, I've encountered that here and there throughout life, but it's like, doesn't do you any good. I mean, if if you could reason with somebody, if you can't reason with them, but you got to give it all you got to reason with them. And if you could help them just a little bit in some way, just kind of, you know, when people were mental, like I said, I went through with my dad, went through with my sister, all of a sudden they're just, they don't make sense. But then if you could bring them a little zone them into reality, it's, it's fulfilling, you know, and, and it's like rewarding. And then, you know, it's, I don't know how to explain it, but it kept me going. You know, and one of the things I landed, one of the biggest water treatment accounts I've ever had, I had Camp Pounded for 12 years. And what's cool about it, I live in L.A., but I got to see my mom once a week when when she was in her 80s. We'd go out, we'd laugh, and we'd talk about life. And it's things that if you're able to kind of do things in addition to what you normally do, it can make a big difference. You know, I, I mean, you got to break the pattern sometimes and you know, you go back, they say when you get older, you go back to where you want, where you were when you were a kid, those great years between the age of what, you know, seven and 20, 14, 18. But it's like, it's kind of cool to go back and hang out with your, the older people around you and just kind of hear what their life stories and laugh. And, you know, it's interesting. 
so much hope in your story. So much. Yeah. And you have me even in my head. Uh, there's so I'm I'm becoming of the belief of I won't I won't stand in any one statement, right? Like because I feel like you can always learn new information that can sway your kind of opinion or whatever. And one of those topics is um nature versus nurture, right? Like so is addiction um hereditary? Is mental illness hereditary? Um, you know, what does that look like? And your story really challenges that it's just about genes. It sounds more like it's about choices. So you just have my brain kind of going. So I figured I would share that with you. (laughs) No, I've heard that so much. I mean, you know, I mean, I've often heard too that, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's like, you know, I used to talk about my dad and I went for therapy. You know, when I went through divorce, I went through a little therapy. I'll never forget the therapist said, you know, you know, it sounds like you're really a super salesman, but, but, you know, you might have a little manic in you because anybody that's super sales or whatever you're doing, it, you're on the edge. But I've maintained that, levelized that edge. You know, I could, you know, I, I remember in high school, a guy tried to hit me up taking reds and pills and stuff, and he did. And I saw him through the years later and he was kind of messed up, you know, and so I, you're right. There's some choices. I look back. I was 14. I was in the ninth grade. I'll never forget that. And he had this, says, where'd you get those, man? He says, I got them from a pharmacist. Well, who knows? That was years ago. But, you know, it's like I took those choices. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I had people around me. I know people today that live on, you know, marijuana and drugs and all that. But it's like it never, you know, I saw what happened to my family. I don't want to take anything if... It's chemistry and genetic that would have affected it, you know? Yeah. So I'm really scared was. about the marijuana. And I'm really scared yeah. about the marijuana, honestly. I think yeah. that there's not enough information. Um, and that's one of those topics where, um, you know, I'm trying to listen to the ones that are using it. Or even, like, my doctor wanted me on it um, for chronic pain. And I'm like... Mm-hmm. I don't like that. It's the catch all for everything Mm -hmm. right now. Um, And then I listen to experts like a Dr. Amen or people that are really talking about, you know, what the impact on the brain and stuff. I just think it's too soon. I think there's too many decisions being made and there's not enough evidence one way or the other. Cause every time I hear both sides and I I hear about both sides, but I'm very, very skeptical. Um, And I, I think it's because three people around me that, ramped up marijuana use their behaviors changed in not favorable mm-hmm. ways so like that's just that yeah. alone. <laughs> like uh, no yeah so but i try to respect everybody's point of view that's what i do i used to go golf with a guy on the golf course and it, you know my heavy sales days and he wanted to always play with me because he could toke up and i wouldn't say anything but it's just fine you know yeah. <laughs> made him play better golf but who knows i don't you know all right, I'm changing our coffee date. When I get to LA, we're golfing together. Right? Yeah, right. Sounds good. Uh, uh, David, yeah, also, is there... I'm a member at the Magic Castle. I'm a bit. I've taken up magic in my later years too. So if you ever come out to LA, we'll take you to Magic Castle if you've never been. I I'm haven't. Guess you never. Yeah, it's a great little place. Yeah. yeah, my my stint was so short, but I am proud of myself. I I did like a trolley tour in San Diego. I made it to both zoos down there. Um, some other stuff. Oh, you know where I went? And I thought it was a pretty neat. So I'm not as savvy on TV and famous people and all of that. But I did go to this like fancy historic bar down by Venice Beach in Santa Monica. um, Where you it's like a big window and you could just watch the most gorgeous sunset. And uh, there was two gentlemen that are in acting class together. And they're telling me there was like three or four famous people in the restaurant. I mean, I had no idea, but I just thought it was the most yeah. like it was beautiful scenery, good food, good company, you know, like quality people you want to be around. Um, and it was my L.A. experience was kind of neat. I met some kids that were producing shows for Netflix and like everybody had a story and I've never paid attention to the arts that way. Um, so it's a different lens, like you growing up in it and then having it in the house. And then mm-hmm. being an outsider and like 
I haven't been to the movies in probably a decade. So like, I know nothing, um, but everybody's like, it's the buzz. So it felt like a new learning experience to me. Oh yeah, it is cool. Yeah. You know, I forgot to mention my oldest son is a producer director. He did flea market flip for reality TV. He got an Emmy for it, did it for seven years. And now he's still, he's been in reality TV for like 25 years. Yeah. It, that came out, you know, he went to Santa Barbara, he quit school and he ended up, he's doing very well. And it's one, pretty it's, exciting. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. And I, so, my, my, my sister went to acting class with Mark Hamill and was on a TV show with a like a big Star Wars guy. So that's, she, okay. she met a lot of famous people when she went to acting school since she was three. It's in the book. She went kite flying with them. Kind of cool. Yeah. That is pretty neat. David, is there anything that we haven't covered or anything um, special that you'd like to share before we wrap up? I want to give you an opportunity. I know it's kind of been on my agenda, but you have so many things I wanted to dive into. Um, So is there anything else that you'd like to share? Well, basically, I just like there. I have my website, www.daviddavidfdorazi.com. And, you know, the books are there on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And my dad's book is The In-Between Artists. Really a cool story. My sister is everybody happy. It will be out for, it'll be out for about three weeks from now. It'll be out. Took me a while, about three years to write and get it through the process. My book will be out in a couple of years. Things keep, the motion keeps going. Uh, I just would like everybody to realize they read the stories. I think I got, I got organizations in the back that if you need to, if you know anybody that needs help, they can go to websites or whatever. I think, I think the whole key is just helping people, especially within the family when you run across mental illness and you know, it, it can make a difference in your life and theirs. It has in mine. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not, a, it's, it's kind of like a dark area to go and not a fun place to go. But in the end, there's a lot of, you can make a turn an, a rotten egg into the best egg in town. You know, it's, it's, uh, makes a big difference because there. if you, they don't have you, they don't have anybody. And sure, they're going to meet a lot of people along the way. But if they're your own blood, it makes a big difference. There's your hope shining through again. I love it. (laughs) Well, this has been a true pleasure and honor, David. Like, I can't even tell you how much value you gave me and my audience today. So I really appreciated you sharing your journey with us. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and I've enjoyed it as well. I look forward to meeting you someday in person. Oh, it's a date. I promise. All right. All right. Sounds good. 